Well, good evening everyone and welcome to this special meeting of the Glenorchy City Council on Monday 20th of June 2022. My name is Beck Thomas, I'm Mayor of Glenorchy and Chair of tonight's special council meeting. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Palawa people as the traditional owners and continuing custodians of this land on which we meet and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Joining me here in council chambers tonight is Alderman Peter Ball, Alderman Angela Ryan, Alderman Jan Dunsby, Deputy Mayor Stephen King. Uh, we have Director of Corporate Services, Jenny Richardson, Alderman Gay Richardson, Alderman Melissa Carlton, Alderman Kelly Sims and Alderman Sue Hickey. Uh, we also have a number of uh, staff present uh, relevant to items on tonight's agenda and our General Manager Tony McMullen is joining us online because unfortunately he's home unwell with COVID. Uh, I take this opportunity before we get into our agenda to read a work health and safety statement for council meetings. Glenorchy City Council takes workplace health and safety seriously and this includes physical and psychological safety. We have a duty to ensure that a safe workplace is provided for employees, elected members, contractors, volunteers and members of the public who may be present at council's workplaces. Council meetings form part of council's workplace and it's expected that everyone who attends council meetings will behave in a polite and respectful manner, refrain from using offensive language or making personal statements and not be aggressive, threatening or speak in a hostile manner. Any disagreement should be expressed respectfully and during debate and in decision making, we must remember we are elected to represent and serve the people of Glenorchy and to make our city the best it can be. Further to this, in line with council meeting rules, comments are turned off for all online streams as it's not acceptable for members of the audience to call out their opinions when they attend meetings in person. It's logical with streaming being our virtual chambers that the same rules apply to participation online. We have uh, seven items on our agenda this evening and item one is apologies. We have apologies this evening from Alderman Simon Fraser. Item two is pecuniary interest notification. Do any aldermen or staff have any pecuniary interests associated with any agenda items this evening? No. Agenda item three is public question time. I know we have Mr. Hangan joining us. Any questions from you this evening, Mr. Hangan? No. Thank you. We have received <coughs> one question on notice this evening from Mr. Alan Wikes, whose question is how much uh, has is allocated for cycle paths? Is this amount an increase or decrease? If a decrease, how is it consistent with the position of Greater Hobart Mayors to reduce car journeys by providing more alternatives? And the answer to this question is in the proposed 2022-23 budget, Council has allocated $40,000 to upgrading or providing new cycling infrastructure. This is a decrease on last financial year uh, as Council is focusing its capital budget on renewing its existing infrastructure for 2022-23. However, council officers are working closely with the Department of State Growth and in collaboration with the other Greater Hobart councils to identify a number of active transport options and feasible projects for consideration in future budgets. Council will also be seeking grant opportunities to fund additional cycling infrastructure projects throughout this 2022-23 uh, <coughs> financial year. Additionally, the Tasmanian Government has set aside $2 million in grant funding for priority cycling projects in Greater Hobart and Council will be working in conjunction with the other Greater Hobart Councils to help deliver these projects. So thank you, Mr White, for that question. Moving on to item four, 2022-23 budget estimates. And we have uh, nine recommendations before us. I won't read them out this evening, given how uh, lengthy they are and how long that would take. Um, but obviously the recommendations are included there before us in the papers, um, which are also available to members of the public. So do I have someone to move those recommendations in relation to a 23 hour move? Alderman Hickey, seconded Alderman Dunsby. Alderman Hickey. Um, thank you, Mayor. I'm uh, quite comfortable that after um, many strong, um, strongly debated or contested um, workshops on this subject that we have landed in a space that I am very comfortable with and I think um, that we have the change of this council to a back to basics 
focus and especially allowing for affordability and the responsibility of to our ratepayers is really, really important. I think in the past we've tried to be all things to all people and it's just not fiscally um, responsible anymore and we just can't afford to keep um, the council going into deficits or such long-term deficits. So it's quite refreshing that we have really as a council worked very hard together to um, get an approach that we can all live with. Personally, I think the rate should be somewhere around 5%, but I say that only because if you're running a business, you would need to recoup money to run a council that provides as many services as this one does. But we are, I think, um, very, very diligently aware of the fact that our particular municipality has some of the um, poorest people in its community who just simply cannot afford one more top up or out of um, the range. You know, another increase after all of the uh, uh, increase in food costs and petrol costs and everything else going up. So I do think we're being responsible by trying to keep it to our long term financial management plan of 3.5%. And we will do everything we can as a council to make sure that there is minimal wastage that our um, we support our officers in looking at the revision of services that this council offers, so that offers, I should say, that so that we are doing the best we can with a minimal amount of resources. Um, I'm also pleased to see that we are increasing our spend as it should be on renewing our assets and progressing some of those big projects that have taken a very long time to get off the planning board and now look like they're realisable. So it's a pity we've still got a $4.5 million deficit, but I think by, with a focused, proactive approach by this council that we will get back into the black as soon as we possibly can and still manage to support our community as best we can. There are a couple of things I had some questions on. Um, is it appropriate for yes. me to ask questions down Yes, here? please. Um, so it is really good to see that we're increasing the capital spend, but that's on major projects like our roads and uh, infrastructure, which I think has been one of the things that our community has been asking us to do, to get back to basics, to start making the city look clean, the roads as best we can, the footpaths as good as we can, and most particularly the play spaces. I was going to ask you, Mayor, if um, if you do get to hold on to, if you do get to use your influence to hold on to any of that grant money, could we please look at um, more money for the public toilet upgrades? Because 0.4 million is not a lot, and it's really only one toilet facility. I'd also make to like uh, like to make a comment on the replacement of motor vehicles, and I have had a conversation with our officers, so I am very happy to know that they will be looking at hybrid or electric vehicles as well, and that we've got scooters and bikes for some of the officers to get around, which at the moment will save a lot on petrol. Um, I think uh, I've got a flag on there for some reason, but yeah, so a three point five percent general rate increase is well and truly below what we would normally do because of the uh, current consumer price index and the controlled expenditure with only new costs assigned to those areas that enhance community safety and provide efficiency across council. So again, it's a commitment to everyone who's listening that we're going to do the best we can as a united council to keep um, our budget on track and I do as much as possible as we can with it. I have a query on the recommendations on recommendation five, if it's just uh, in it says um, that we resolve that pursuant to section 94 of the Act for the financial year council sets a minimum amount payable in respect of the general rate at $208.25. I think that should say per annum, but I, I don't know whether that's just a technicality. Do you have a problem with that, Director Richardson? Uh, I, uh, I know it's a given, but I'm just wondering if it's a technical thing. I'll just defer to the CFO to Tina. To just to clarify whether perinums actually require a requirement or not. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, yes, Alderman, he gives $208.25. Thank you. 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 Thank you
25 per annum. So, so we don't need a, an amendment to put PA behind that or per annum? Um, we don't, uh, unless there's a, um, a technical reason. <laughs> okay, then. Um, I'm going to say for the financial year. Yeah. Okay. And what about um, number eight? In that it probably relates to seven and eight, uh, where we're resolving a penalty of 10% for people who don't pay by the due date, and we're resolving that an interest rate of 8.125% per annum apply. I'm just wondering if we should have an amendment that says, unless negotiations with the council hardship policy are applied by the general manager, because we do need people to know that there is a hardship policy. This is going to be a really tough year on everybody. Whilst we don't want anyone taking advantage of it, I think when we're putting up significantly um, penalty rates, that we should also acknowledge that for those who are struggling, we do have a hardship policy. Um, through you, Mayor, I'm happy to take that as a um, an amendment if that's what we would like to do. I, I mean, it's um, very worthwhile that um, yes, our community is aware that we do have a financial hardship policy. It hasn't been um, strongly utilised in the past, um, but very happy to um, take that on board so that it's advocated for at every possible opportunity for our ratepayers should they need it. Sure, thank you. Um, may I suggest, Alderman Hickey, perhaps we could add it as recommendation 10, that council, so it's separate on its own, that council continues to um, promote the availability of its hardship policy or con continues to offer? Yes, maybe offers. Offer. Yes, yeah, offer. or negotiates yeah. with um, residents who are in difficulty. I'm not really that fussed about the wording, so yeah. whatever the officers yeah. recommend there. Yeah. But uh, I want to be seen as a council that does care and has heart. Thank you. So as you move the motion um, and you're putting that as an amendment, are you satisfied with that? Alderman Dunsby as the seconder. Mm -hmm. saying, add that in as um, recommendation 10. So council continues to offer um, or to, continues to what do you provide, assistance. provide, provide yeah. assistance. Yep. With access to the hardship policy. Yeah. I mean, there may only be five people on a dog that read this all this paperwork, but Whatever, I still would like to um, commend the officers and all of the aldermen for their input in getting to this place because it wasn't looking like this a while back and I think it's been a tough decision for this council to arrive if we do accept 3.5%. It's, it's been tough on some of our members to, you know, um, not go for something lesser because that would be politically more palatable. But um, I am comfortable that we've done the very best we can as a team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion beyond Alderman Dunn's? Uh, firstly, just a question in relation to that. I'm just wondering if the council officers can also include in the paperwork that goes out with the rates some information about the hardship policy so it's there again rather than having to read through the rates notice. Sorry, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so we can add that to our flyer of information. Yeah, thank you. As well. okay, um, so the cost of delivering core services to council's community continues to increase with demand for services experiencing significant growth. <clears throat> the city continues to expand with ongoing population and housing growth due to several significant developments occurring over recent months and planned for the coming year. In time, these will contribute to the incoming growth of our council with the population growth to add to the vibrancy and warmth of our community. Council has been the beneficiary of a number of state and federal government grants for the upgrade and construction of community infrastructure. While this funding enables significant investment in facilities to the community, ongoing operational costs will be incurred in maintaining and managing these facilities. We've had to accommodate these extra costs within the budget before us tonight. The long-term financial management plan forecasts ongoing deficits for the short term until a projected return to surplus in the 2026 20, 27 financial year. Future rate increases are predicted at 3.5% per annum as Council manages its ongoing sustainability by modelling the expenditure impacts of the substantial investment in new assets and ongoing cost increases of services and materials. <clears throat> we have been mindful from the very earliest discussions that our aim was to minimise the impact on ratepayers while shouldering the governance responsibilities in our role as your elected members. As a collective, we have challenged the general manager to find every <coughs> cost saving, cut unnecessary spends, while dealing with the worldwide rising cost of materials, transport and tradespeople. 
balancing this budget is not dissimilar to the household budget. We've just got a few more zeros in the figures. I believe the figures put before you tonight represent middle ground in the balance between representation and governance. It is both required and sensible expenditure. But it does not stop here. We continue to push the operational challenge, as I previously mentioned, that we put to the general manager. We are mindful and sensitive to the many aspects that come with any potential changes enacted, but the future of the finances of the City of Gonorki impact on all of us in some way. Thank you, Alderman Dunsby. Any further discussion? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Thank you, Michael Alderman, that already spoken. Uh, without a doubt, in all my years on council, this is probably the most we've dug into the budget we've started pretty much as soon as we approved the other one and started talking about the next year's budget and thank you to the staff and to phil alderman for all the work that's gone into this this is a decision we make tonight but a decision made with a lot of input and a lot of backroom work so uh, we haven't come to this decision easily it's been a lot of hard work or we haven't come to a decision yet at all but we, we we're here to make a decision based on all the work that's been done and just want to thank everyone for their efforts and have the public know that uh, this council in particular has put a lot of effort into determining what's right for our council at this particular time. And the year just changed and evolved as it went on and, and we've had to sort of move with it. So here we are now and, and uh, I'm grateful for the, the efforts everyone's put in. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any further discussion? Alderman Carlton. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just following on from our Deputy Mayor's comments just regarding the input that's gone into um, the council. So I'd certainly like to acknowledge uh, the work of our staff here at Council, um, the Aldermen, uh, for the workshops that we've um, been participating in over the last couple of months, but also just acknowledge that this year um, we, from particularly my um, my uh, perspective, we've had a lot more opportunities for public to be involved um, in uh, the setting of the budget. So you can see in the report itself, um, it just gives a brief summary of, of some of the um, community consultation that's taken place. Um, there have been quite a few opportunities for the community to have their say and that certainly um, guided us in terms of um, coming to um, a, a position tonight or, or being able to consider a position tonight. Um, but just um, really encourage people to take the opportunity to have their say and to be involved in um, community uh, participation. Um, I know that um, you know, we have seen a lot more people participating this year, but we're still not seeing the numbers that we'd like to see in terms of people um, contributing, and, and that is something that we're going to be looking at um, later in the year, but really just um, encourage people to have their say and, and to know that we do actually welcome um, their contribution and those contributions that we've had um, in the lead up to this have certainly gone into um, informing the proposed budget that we've got in front of us. I did have a question. I had some similar questions to Alderman um, Hickey earlier uh, around um, just making sure that it's well known that we do have a hardship policy and that these particular penalties won't apply. So talk to council early um, and um, take advantage of the opportunity to um, be involved in the hardship policy. But also uh, just in terms of recommendation nine, I just want to get some clarity around recommendation nine, which is resolving that the rates levied in accordance with this resolution are payable to the council by four equal instalments. So we certainly provide an opportunity for people to um, pay in instalments. Um, I understand that people can pay in a lump sum, so they've got to pay by the 17th of March. But I'm also aware that the direct debits actually mean that the full payment won't be by the 17th of March. So does that recommendation uh, reflect that or do we need to communicate that uh, direct debit? You can actually sign up for a direct debit plan, a fortnightly plan, which will take you through to, I believe, the end of April. So how does that fit in with this particular recommendation? Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, anyway. through, through you, Mayor, thank you. Um, yes, you're absolutely correct, Alderman Carlton. Um, if a ratepayer of ours chooses to go on to a direct debit arrangement, which we actively promote and encourage um, because it is um, much easier, 
um, they are able to extend that. Our standard arrangement takes those repayments out to approximately the 30th of April, wherever the, the weekdays fall then. Um, if any ratepayer would like to actually enter into an arrangement um, on a direct debit um, that took about, say, into to May, we're also happy to do that as well and to facilitate that. The actual instalment is due on the 17th of March, but if, there's, if there are excuse me, on, a, um, on an agreed arrangement under a direct debit. They do not incur penalties and interest whilst they are complying with that direct debit arrangement. So we're happy to work with any rate payer to find an arrangement that actually works for them. And, and I, I think that's quite, um, you know, I'm really quite proud of our council for making those opportunities available. And I certainly remember um, when this council um, first sat in this particular group that um, we didn't have that many options um, available as we do now. But in terms of what we've got here, in terms of the recommendation, which is around um, the instalments, uh, if, does that satisfy um, the, op the ability for people to enter in that directive or do we need to actually reference that in the list of recommendations? Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely. Um, so um, the actual instalment is due, uh, fourth instalment is due on the 17th of March, so that complies with the requirements under the Act. People can then enter into payment arrangements outside of that, that um, council officers have appropriate delegation to sign off on for those arrangements that's outside of that, as opposed to the standard, which is the 17th of March for the last instalment. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Carlton. Anything further? Okay. Any further, uh, Alderman Ball? Thank you. Just following up on that question, the direct debit, can that be done to credit cards? Uh, through you, Mayor, um, unfortunately our current system does not allow for the safe, um, secure um, uh, storage of a credit card number. Um, it's called PCI DSS compliance. So because our current IT system is not compliant, which means we couldn't safely keep people's credit card numbers, we're unable to do that. I'm very hopeful that um, any new system we may obtain certainly would allow that. Thank you. Any further discussion of the item? Oh, Alderman Carlton, do you have a question? Sorry, I, I did have one further question. So one of the uh, recommendations is in relation to the long-term financial management plan, mm -hmm. and we're being asked to um, approve um, the item in, in attachment to, and I noticed that earlier in the report, the only reason why this is coming to us tonight to approve is because um, it's been updated to reflect results of this year's budget or this year's results. So we had the long-term financial plan come to us previously, which we um, agreed to um, some changes. So I just wanted to be clear about the reason why it's come back to us tonight. Um, and is it because of this year's budget or this year's results that it's been brought back to us. Absolutely. So through you, Mayor. Um, it, it's both actually, Alderman Carlton. So under the Act, we are only required to update our long-term financial management plan every four years. We actively choose to update it because we're in a fairly dynamic environment, as you know, um, and our financial um, world can change considerably, even in 12 months, let alone over a four-year period. So um, we are recommending an update to long-term financial management plan which now incorporates revised forecasts as a result of the 30 June 2021 actual results and also reflects the future forecasting based on the proposed 22-23 budget as well. So it takes into a, a more up-to-date position of information that we're aware of and forecasts it accordingly from that. Okay, so um, where it says this year's budget, it means 22-23? It means 2122. Okay. <laughs> yes, so it gets very confusing with all these financial years together. Yeah. Yeah. So when we refer to this year's budget, it is 2122. So things we know from doing the 2122 budget, yeah. the actuals that have occurred previously, plus what we're also forecasting moving forward. Okay. So there's three different sets of data. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's, um, and I guess in the report, what I'm seeing here, what it's saying is it's reflect the results of this year's budget. So that's why I just wanted to clarify that. Absolutely. What we're talking about is actually three different things. Um, and, and, they, and so they, they, it's just those three things that have resulted in an update, long term financial plan coming to us. 
Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Carter. Alderman Richardson. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to address this too, because budgeting is a real balancing act. In formulating this budget, we've strived to maintain financial responsibility or taking into consideration the impact increasing costs of living are having on our community. Bearing in mind, Council has to meet those increased costs of work as well. And it's not just utility and services and supply costs, it's staff costs as well. And our staff costs make up 40% of our budget. Under our enterprise bargaining agreement, there is a commitment to 2.1% employee benefit increase and 0.5% um, superannuation guarantee for staff that's got to be found. Um, in trying to keep our rates and charges to a minimum at the same time as improving Council's financial stability, increased expenditure on capital works um, and deliver essential services, Council has committed to continue looking for savings such as such as expenditure control and revenue opportunities. So that's a good thing. In addition to the 3.5% general rate increase, the budget has a 1% growth built into it, um, which is good. And um, TAS water distributions return to its um, usual return of 2.1 million. Um, so it's not all gloom and doom. Some councils carry a high level of debt. We don't. Um, our borrowings amount to approximately 1.3 million, and uh, which is minimal considering a recurrent um, income of 66 million. And our loans are fixed, so that's a positive. Unfortunately, there is no contingency allocation in the budget, but I believe this can be adjusted as our financial position improves. Um, considering council is unable to ensure um, assets against extreme weather conditions um, due to prohibitive insurance costs. This will be welcome down the track where we can afford it. Council has run a deficit for longer than desired um, due to unforeseen and unfortunate circumstances and COVID being one of them. But while the budget predicts an underlying operating deficit of 4.5 million, there is careful, carefully planned road to recovery in the long-term financial management plan. And the plan, the current plan is to return to surplus by 2026-27. So together with the asset management plan, that ensures our assets are maintained. So that's a positive. And there's nearly $17 million in there for major projects, which is... Um, which is built in and which is very exciting for the community. So we look forward to the delivery of those. Thank you everybody for, for all the effort you put into the budget. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Any further discussion? Alderman Ryan. Okay. Um, Tim. Well, I did have a question, but thankfully Alderman Carlton had covered that. We, we had a previous discussion, so we appreciate that information. Um, I suppose then most things have already been said and covered. I won't repeat that and take up unnecessary time besides saying that's just unfortunately it's not an ideal position for a council or any business to be in, but it's the position we find ourselves in due to several impacting factors over um, some of these are long term, some of these are medium, some of them are short. Um, and unfortunately, we can dwell on the past, but we need to look to the future and be responsible. So I appreciate that this council has done so. And I even more so appreciate the work that the staff are doing and um, some of the challenges that will come from this. And hopefully we can all work together to get better outcomes more cohesively. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Sims. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, I just concur with what my fellow Aldermen have said. Costs are rising everywhere at the moment, and because these are in certain uncertain times, I advocate a cautious approach. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, for the year ending March 2022, inflation, or CPI, was at 5.1%, but the trimmed mean annual inflation is at 3.7%. So this is really in line with the proposed rise of council rates. However, according to the local government organisation, council cost index also takes into account 
wage costs as well as road and bridge costs above CPI. So that puts the rise for the years 2021 to 22 to just over 4%. However, any proposal must be balanced against the effect that it will have on our ratepayers, as some of our aldermen, other aldermen have said tonight, particularly those who are struggling. The proposed rising is, in my view, a moderate increase, and that's what's called for at this time. The increase reflects Council's ongoing commitment to the community and will allow it to continue to deliver and improve upon the programs and services for our community for the coming year. Thank you, Alderman Wright. Alderman Paul, anything from you? Uh, no, nothing further. Thank you. It's all been said. Excellent. It has. Very uh, good summary and debate around the table tonight. So I thank my fellow Alderman for your consideration um, of this really important task that we have as Council. It is a significant responsibility that we take on each year. And as the Deputy Mayor said this year, we did certainly start these discussions perhaps earlier than, than ever um, with a number of different workshops on focused on different areas. I think the first one was in October talking about priorities and opportunities to increase revenue and, and decrease expenditure. So um, we've, we've been exploring really well as a team, um, not only around the table, but with um, our general manager and, and the directors and other staff here at Council. So I, I'm really grateful for that team approach that we've had um, this year. I think, um, you know, we can hear through the discussion what a difference it makes when we work effectively as a team. And that sense of team is something that I think we should really be proud of um, across Council. Um, this 3.5% increase is uh, is modest given the cost increases that we're facing as a council, but as has been said, we recognise that times are tough out there and cost of living is increasing across the board. Um, we do recognise also, though, that our community has, um, you know, quite high expectations. Well, not high, but... Um, uh, wants good services, wants more and better all the time. And we around the table constantly say we want to deliver on those expectations of our community. The people of Glenorchy deserve to have good playgrounds and open spaces for recreation and, and health benefits um, and good safe roads and footpaths. All those back to basic things are what we're going to be focused on going forward. And that's certainly what this budget is all about. So, um, so I'm happy to support the recommendations before us this evening. Um, note also the discussion around the hardship policy, which is also <coughs> important because we are a council with heart um, and recognise that for some people, uh, cost increases are difficult. So we, um, we have that hardship policy in place. So thank you, Alderman Hickey, for raising that as an amendment to the recommendations. But as I say, it has been really great debate. There's not a lot more I can add. I was feeling myself nodding um, as, as you were all speaking. So uh, thank you all for your well-considered contribution to the debate tonight. And I'll go back to the mover, Alderman Hickey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think in an election year, uh, it is always tough for people to have to stick to their guns and stay with the long-term financial plan that this council committed to. It's also tough when we know that decisions we make um, affect people who are really struggling with an ability to pay. But as I said earlier, I think this council has been quite brave, brave by its officers and brave by its aldermen to continue to debate and thrash out how we can do this better. And I do feel like there has been a change in focus around all of us that we must deliver more with less as best as we possibly can. And we're not the only council with this dilemma, obviously. So maybe there'll be an increased impetus to look at resource sharing amongst the councils. We've got to find more efficient ways of um, doing more with less. And we want to be a council that actually delivers uh, the things that the residents are paying good money for. So as I say, in, in different times, we um, might be tempted to do a lesser rate rise, but this is a reasonable rate rise given the incredible fiscal restraints on a council of this size with the expectations of it as a city. So I'm happy to commend this budget and again, recognise the work, the hard work of everybody who put in to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hickey. I will put the recommendations to the vote. Please raise your hand to indicate if you are for. That is carried unanimously. Tina breathes a sigh of relief. <laughs> Thank you. 
Moving on to item five, Glenorchy City Council Annual Plan 2022-23 to 2025-26. We have a recommendation that Council adopt the Glenorchy City Council Annual Plan 2022-23 to 25-26 in the form of attachment one. I have someone to move this recommendation, please. Alderman Richardson, someone to second. Alderman Dunsby, Alderman Richardson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, the annual plan sets out the focus areas for the next 12 months and is taken from the Glenorchy Community Plan. It aligns with the various uh, council strategies and the budget. Considerable work has gone into developing the plan and it, and it will inform business plans going forward. I just wish to thank everybody for their input and look forward to the progress reports that will come out of that. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Any further discussion of the item? Alderman Hickey. Yes, I'd just like to uh, say that it is exciting to see that we will be authorising 31.511 million capital expenditure because I do believe we've fallen behind in the maintenance and uh, delivery of some of the infrastructure that we have been given grants for. It's taken a long time to get these things through, but I can definitely feel the momentum and I think in the next year we're going to see a lot more progress in all of these areas. So that's quite exciting uh, to see. And I'd like to commend the officers for the hard work in um, refocusing their resources to get these things done. So thank you, Mayor. I think it's a good good outcome. Thank you, Alderman Hickey. Any further discussion? No further discussion? No? Well, I will um, add my two cents worth. I agree this is uh, an annual plan that is focused on um, delivering on the ground for the people of Glenorchy. We have a significant uh, amount of capital works in the budget and significant amount of uh, projects that have been on our books, if you like, for um, since probably since we were elected as a council initially back in 2018. And we are getting movement on those within this particular annual plan, which is fantastic, something our community um, should be really excited about. And I certainly am um, excited about as well. Um, this is does you know also have that focus on that as we talked about in our last item, debating our last item on that back to basics. I'm focusing on the things that through the community consultation process on our budget that people are telling us are most important to them. It's on roads, it's footpaths, environmental management, and um, and th those those core things that people, um, parks and open spaces, playgrounds, all of those things are what um, are we are focusing our efforts on through this annual plan. So I'm happy to support it. And uh, I know it's something that comes to us quarterly, a report on, we get quarterly, and that's really significant. It takes a lot of um, work to coordinate that annual plan quarterly reporting. So um, so that's something that you know I, I look forward to receiving each quarter. And I think we, um, we can do better in uh, promoting to our community as well about what we're achieving through um, you know, the, the accountability we have to them through the annual plan. So happy to adopt this and support this and um, look forward to getting on with it. Is there any further discussion? Alderman Sims. Uh, just through the Mayor, in regards to it referring to 2022, 23 to 25, 26, which is covering four years, could you elaborate for the community on why it states that? Sure. Uh, would you like to address that one? Uh, Mr. Fox might like to talk to the plan. Good evening. Um, so through you, Mayor, <coughs> each year we do a four-year annual plan to identify the priorities for the upcoming four years. Um, we focus obviously on the 12 months ahead, but it is each year a rolling 12 year plan. So each year, it, um, as you'll see, it has the priority actions for the coming year. Uh, and in the back of the annual plan, you'll notice in the appendices, it's got the, the three forward years as well, uh, the out years, um, where we identify those actions will be all Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Alderman Carter. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I noticed in this year's annual plan, which is an addition and really good to see, is um, we have an appendix, which is strategic documents. And that brings together all of the different plans, master plans and strategies uh, that council has adopted and um, lets us know whether that's a um, legislated um, document, a strategic document, or it's an informing strategic document. So um, I, I imagine that a informing document means that um, though that particular document has been used to help create um, the annual plan. I just want to check to see what um, 
in some instances, um, it doesn't say yes or no for informing. It has a dash. And I just wondered what's the dash next. So for example, climate change adaptation, um, plan, environment strategy, 2013, 2023, the public toilet strategy and the Glenorchy Mountain Bike Master Plan. Um, don't have a yes or a no um, next to them as to whether they've actually informed this year's annual plan. So I just wanted to see um, what that might what that might mean. They have um, all of the documents have informed the plan. I'll have to go back and check why there's no little um, yes or no. Um, I think it's more uh, legislative document um, versus a so a high level strategy versus an underpinning document. Um, the high level in legislative documents will obviously come to council for sign off and, and regular review, whereas the informing strategies sit underneath those if you like. Um, and yeah, I will check up on why they have no little. Why they don't say no, why they just Yeah, I couldn't know. work out why. So I just didn't know if there was a reason. And um, some of them may be um, slightly out of date now and need upgrading. So it might be a matter of um, that they're in review or that they need um, need some review. Yeah, some of them are quite recent and some of them are um, quite um, mature, maybe, or old, mm -hmm. <laughs> shall we say. Um, and just uh, around. The, the strategies each come, uh, they, they come to us with a bunch of actions. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously those actions then get fed back into um, the annual plan mm -hmm. so that we're able to then go to track and say sport and rec strategy, here are the actions. Mm -hmm. You know, are we actually able then to pull a report to say of these actions that were this particular strategy, we could just actually pull a report on those particular actions? So all of the strategies and actions and the annual plan actions are in our internal reporting system yeah. called Cascade and our, uh, our managers and coordinators and our staff report back on all of those. Um, all of those uh, strategies and actions and informing documents don't come forward to council. You would be getting hundreds yeah. and hundreds of... I see over two hundred and something sub actions, yeah. or you know, that, and and you know that is that is operational. Just just checking to see, you know, um, because we have adopted a lot of strategies and a lot of master plans, and a lot of actions have come across our desk. So I'm comforted to hear that all of those get put into the annual plan, and there is that um, reporting process that's happening operationally or monitoring process that's happening. Yeah. And it's good to actually see all of those strategies there that are that are. You know, involved in or, or have been put into the actual annual plan. So that's a great um, addition this year. Thank you. Thanks to the, the staff for including that. Thank you, Alderman Carlton. Alderman another question. Um, just in forward of Alderman Colton's comments, I'd like to um, publicly uh, give a lot of credit to Alderman Colton for that to occur, actually. I know that's something that um, was discussed early on when first elected around linking a lot of those documents and working cohesively and actually having meaning and being able to obviously hit quite a few layers at once um, within certain projects and programs and departments and it appears to be happening really well now and we can see some of those outcomes which is quite exciting um, I think for us who've had those discussions for many years now. So well done to the staff. One question is, um, just because it's such a great tool for us to communicate to the community what we're doing um, and what the plans are and why, um, were the community consulted on how the annual plan should look and what information they would like in it? Uh, in terms of the, the broader consultation we did on our, it was more on our budget and the priorities for our community. So um, absolutely that information that we've obtained through that survey that is reference, was referenced in the uh, previous item in relation to our budget and also the discussions that we've been having at our community yarns um, as well have been around what are the priorities for you and for your area. So most definitely, I think over the last six months in particular, we've had a lot more engagement with our community on what their priorities are than, than we have uh, in previous years and all that feeds in and that needs to be an ongoing conversation. So rather than it being a one-off tell us what you think about the annual plan, ongoing. You know, we're having these conversations to determine what's important for you, you know, talking to people at Collinsvale about what are the priorities for you and the needs for your area. We had the um, one at Claremont recently as well. So that's really helped to inform um, what matters, I think, and, and what goes into the plan. Um, we have already had some discussions uh, about how we can further improve the consultation process, both on our budget and our annual plan, and 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 looking to next year, putting out um, 
most definitely the budget um, in full, uh, but potentially also the annual planning, something we consider around putting it out and inviting public submissions. Um, some other councils do do that, put it out, you know, four weeks um, earlier than, than what we did um, this year. To, to actually get that, um, have that opportunity for, for, for community members, organisations to make more fuller submissions around the budget. So it's something we're continually working to improve, recognising the importance of yeah. community engagement. But Thank you, I appreciate that. Just in follow up, I really appreciate that um, the actual content is more accurately addressing the community's concerns and um, we seem to be doing that more holistically at this stage now. Um, but just the actual annual plan and the content of it and the format and the layout, um, have the community given specific feedback on what they would like to see in that and how they would like that to be presented to them? Uh, no, not in terms of the format. Oh, no, okay. it's not something we've ever had discussion on. All right, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion or questions? We'll go back to the movie with Alderman Richardson to close debate. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just mentioned before, there are many, many more actions that come out of the community plan. Um, a lot happens behind the scenes. This is just a focus for 2223. Yeah. Um, I've moved it back. Thank you. I'll put the recommendation. Please raise your hand if you're for. That is carried unanimously. Moving on to item. 6, 2022-23 Capital Works Program and Budget. We have recommendations that Council endorse the Glenorchy City Council 2022-23 Financial Year Capital Works Program presented in Attachment 1 and 2, authorise a $31.511 million capital expenditure associated with Council's Capital Works Program for the 2022-23 Financial Year from 1st of July 2021. Drive someone to move these recommendations. Alderman Richardson, seconded Alderman Dunsby. The floor is yours again, Alderman Richardson. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yes, this is year one, I believe, of a 10 year, um, 10 year capital works program, which is built into the long term financial um, management plan. Uh, Council has proposed a works program of 31 point million, as we've said, um, for asset renewal, upgrade, and acquisition. This is a significant increase um, in prior commitments, um, especially when you include the seventeen point, um, the sixteen point seven for for major projects, which we mentioned earlier. It's not an easy job identifying the priorities in in the plan. There are so many competing elements and factors to consider: asset condition analysis, risk ratings. Necessity requests from public. We get requests from public and initiatives from the community groups. It's, as I said earlier, a balancing act. Then if that's not enough, quite often circumstances will change um, due to outside circumstances or, or outside council's control and things then get juggled around as we saw earlier in the year. Um, so there's a lot of work to that and thank you everybody for that um, and look forward to um, going forward with that. Thanks. Thank you, Alderman Richardson. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to concur with Alderman Richardson and thank the staff for the hard work that they've put into this and getting us to this point and um, concur with the report as it is and, and thank you particularly to Director Rowley and his team. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Further discussion. Alderman Dunsby. Thank you. Um, we've, throughout our time on council, we've, we've faced a lot of difficulties. You know, we've, we've had to do a lot of repair mode. We've gone through the ministerial directions. And then we were faced with COVID and other difficulties. You know, we've had fires, we've had floods as well to add into the mix. So every year, if, if we analyse the period that we've been on council, we've had to do a lot of extenuating circumstances. And some of those have impacted greatly on our delivery of some of these capital projects. But all being well, we hope to see now that all these ones and all those problems have now been got over and they're going to be delivered within this next financial year. And I think our, our community will be very appreciative of all these assets. Um, we know that some of them come at an extra cost to council, even though there are grants there, it does actually cost the council money to accept that money and provide those. And we're very happy to do that. But as we've said, it's a back to basics 
um, budget this year. This capital budget reflects that, but it also includes the, the money, the projects from the money from the state and federal government, which we look forward to seeing implemented in this next financial year. Thank you, Lord Mendonsky. Thank you for the discussion. Lord McCarthy. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with all the comments around the table so far. Um, I did want to just um, have a little bit more information just regarding one of the uh, risks that's been identified in the risk management um, section of the report. So on page 42, we have a, um, a risk that is um, rated high. Uh, consequently major and a likelihood being um, likely. Uh, and that's that the budget amount in one particular year is different from the capital expenditure projected in the strategic asset management plan and the long-term financial plan, uh, causing adverse impacts on council's long-term financial sustainability and asset performance. So just wanted to get a little bit more um, um, information or clarity around that particular risk. And um, we obviously have a, um, a, a treatment that's been put forward and that is around um, monitoring of the performance of council assets on an ongoing basis, revising projections in both the strategic asset management plan and long-term financial plan, and to ensure council's elected members and management can make informed decisions should council wish to underfund its capital renewal expenditure or overfund new equity assets. So given that we're um, approving the capital budget for next year, just wanted to get a little bit more information about what that particular risk means for council. Thank you. Director Rialli, would you like to answer that one? Thank you, Mayor. Um, through you, Mayor, um, Alderman Carlton. Uh, it's talking about the um, the need to keep the funding levels um, up to uh, what our consumption is of those assets. So our assets will wear out over time. So we need to be making sure that we're looking ahead and, and uh, forecasting enough money into the budget and the long-term financial plan to keep up with that rate of depreciation and consumption. Okay. So that's pretty much what it's um, talking about. So there is a risk of underfunding or, or not actually allocating enough money or, or resource to actually uh, keep up with that, then we'll have a, uh, a backlog in our, um, in our renewal program, which takes a long time to yeah. catch up again. And um, I raise that in the context that it's been um, a topic that we've discussed quite a lot um, in the, the budget this year to make sure that we're not causing um, that situation. So in terms of um, the risk identification, it is something that we've been really mindful of and really conscious of. And that is why we're starting to see a bit more money being spent in this particular area so that we don't have an under um, spend, which is going to be a cost in the future. But essentially um, what we're looking at spending next year is uh, you know, it's going to be funding what we actually need. Uh, through you, Mayor, we, we're actually modelling um, that uh, consumption or depreciation into future years, much, much like we can model out um, well, a long time in advance, but we use about 30 years to see how the assets will perform. So we know what sort of investment we should be um, uh, putting into our assets to keep them at a certain condition. So we're aiming for a a condition level three, which is not too high, but not too low. And um, so we know what we need um, each year for the next 30 years to make sure we're maintaining that level of service. And the current long-term financial plan looks at that three. So what we're looking at in the long-term financial plan is um, achieving that. So they will start to match us from next year, I believe. As from next year, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, good question. Any further discussion? I'm a question through the Mayor. Um, I noticed that we have several funding gaps in uh, most of the programs. I'm just wondering what Council's plans are for mitigating or addressing these. And I think you kind of answered some of that in the last question. Yeah, we, through you, Mayor, with the modelling that we have, um, we've identified what, where we might be um, underfunding uh, the certain asset groups to keep it at that level of service we, we want to maintain. So. Um, we, we are looking to adjust the long-term financial plan to suit um, the amount that we need to be putting into our asset renewal program. So yes, we've modelled that and um, it is the plan going forward. So now it's reflective. Yes, yep. so we shouldn't have those gaps going forward. Okay, thank you. Unless other special circumstances mm, yes, well, occur. So yes. it's always a- We just had COVID, so. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Director. 
any further discussion? No? Sure, I think, thank you for raising that particular question because it certainly is something that we've had quite a significant discussion about over the course of the past um, six to nine months when we've been having these workshops and, and the, I guess the, we've been perhaps provided with more information than ever um, in, in discussing and determining our budget this year and I think that's really helped us get a really good understanding as a council we're at a, a different level of maturity than perhaps we were um, you know when we reflect on four years ago when we came in and the t completely different circumstances we had and I think one of the things that has really become really quite apparent to us this year has been around that importance of adequately funding our renewal requirements <laughs> our asset management plan and matching them up with our long-term financial management plan and, and it's really pleasing um, to see um, Director Riali and his team working to address that so um, so I think that's that's really good and I'm happy to support the proposed uh, capital works budget any further discussion I will go back to the mover Alderman Richardson to close <coughs> the vote. nothing further to it I'm happy to go to the vote I will put the vote please raise your hand indicate if you're for that is carried unanimously <coughs> Moving on to this, oh, sorry, Alderman. Oh, no, no, I'm just getting ready. Ooh. I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm very passionate about item six. Before I can even say, moving on to um, oh, six. Oh, item seven. Yes, thank you. Item uh, seven. Uh, seventh and final item uh, on our agenda, addition to fees and charges schedule 2022-23. And there is a recommendation that I won't read out because uh, Alderman Hickey is chomping at the bit to chomping nearly <laughs> move an, a, uh, an amendment. Yes, thank or you. Or an alternative motion, perhaps, Alderman Hickey. Uh, I think we do need an amendment, and if I could explain it first. So this is about an additional fee and charges um, to our schedule of 2022, and it relates to the dangerous dog category. In an ideal world, as a, a dog lover and a mother of two, I would not have any um, dangerous dogs in our municipality or in the state. But they do come about not just because of a breed, but sometimes lack of training and a whole range of reasons. So I was even told today how fluffy the dog could turn into a dangerous dog, which was quite <laughs> alarming. Um, our council, so I need to explain this, our council has a range of fees from $35 to $115. Other Southern Tasmanian councils range from $300 to $1,191. So I think as we have uh, identified 10 dangerous dogs in our municipality, it doesn't sound like a lot, but these dogs that I know of have eaten other people's pets, cats, chickens and birds. Um, they have also tragically bitten off the finger of one of our residents in this municipality, which led, has led to lifelong trauma since that event, and that woman has not been able to seek recompense due to the circumstances of that case, but it was a known dangerous dog. So I do not think that increasing this fee to $200 is anywhere near reflective of the amount of work that goes into dealing with dangerous dogs because often there's several notifications. They have to be uh, confiscated, confined for three or four months until they're either euthanised or returned to the owner with a whole lot of compliance and then they need the supervision of that compliance. This is an enormous risk to our officers. I can't imagine anything more frightening than confronting a very angry dog, let alone some very angry owners who sometimes might be more scary than the dog. But we do have to look at the costs, the risk, and the legal fees, um, housing these dangerous dogs for some time, often if there's legal cases attached to them. So what I'm going to propose is that we amend it um, initially to $500 for this year and $1,000 the year after. We have to disincentivize people from keeping dangerous dogs, and ideally, I'd go to $1,000 this year, but I think, you know, we need to step it. So it's quite a strong message to the community. If you cannot control your animal, if you are prepared to risk your neighbour's animals and their health and possibly their children, and you are also putting our officers at risk, then you will pay a penalty. So this is about dog management and um, dog uh, care and responsibility. 
So we're not talking about a whole lot of people in the community. Of these 10 dangerous dogs, I believe several of them relate to one or two owners. So I don't think this is going to be having a huge financial ramification for the whole community. And in fact, I don't think it's anything about fund, fundraising or increasing the income. To me, this is purely about addressing the cost and making a statement that we expect responsible dog or any pet management as a council. So who seconded this? Does anyone? No one, because you hadn't told us what you wanted. Oh. <laughs> so I hadn't, hadn't taken a deep breath, because as you can hear, I'm very passionate about it. I'll second it. Okay, so are you prepared to second it uh, as 500 and then 1,000, or would you prefer to go straight to the one? Come on. A brave man. I would love to have 500 with a penalty for any dangerous dog that gets out and does attack anyone, a massive penalty because, and I'll That's, explain that in a minute, but yes. nevertheless. I support that too. Yeah, nevertheless, whether that needs to be added to what you want to say, yes. then, because I, I just think it's totally unacceptable. So, dangerous dogs attack. So I think, so So Alderman Dickey's moved the um, recommendation that is up on the screen there, and we're talking about seconding that as a motion, but mm -hmm. in terms of Penalties, I think they already apply through yeah. the um, Dog Control Act, and we have provision. To, uh, there are provisions for penalties already under the Dog Control Act, so I don't know that we need to go. I oh, know that's my hard talking, and I'll explain yeah. why in a minute. Sure. So, so you're seconding that as a motion? Yes. Yes. Alderman Hickey, you have already at five hundred dollars to one. At five hundred. Spoken to it. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, Deputy Mayor, would you like to speak to the item? Would you like to open further debate first? Oh, well, no, I'm happy to speak to it now. Uh, and I guess I was passionate about it before, but this morning my daughter was driving in a different council, in a different council to uh, school with the children and uh, chose to jump out of the car and separate a large dog from attacking a small dog with two elderly people. I said, why did you do that? She said, because somebody had to. And she could have been really hurt, but she's trained dogs before. She managed to separate the situation. Dangerous dogs to me are just not acceptable. There's no need. Having been a service technician and gone to a number of people's houses where dangerous, um, I don't see the need for them. I just don't see the need. So if somebody, if, if this if, uh, discourages people from having that sort of animal in their home, then all well, all well and good. If it protects our staff, all well and good. Anything to do that. So that's how I feel. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just before, can I just ask a clarifying question here, um, perhaps of you, Director Ronaldson. When we're talking about dangerous dogs, uh, we're talking about, we're not talking about necessarily a dog that escapes and bites someone or a dog. We're talking about declared based on breed, right? So we just, I just want to be clear yeah, about no, I that. Appreciate that. It's not breed. So, mm. well, can you, can you just, when does can you just clarify dangerous? that? When it's about? classified. Yeah, so when, when a dog is declared, if you could just clarify that for us. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and good evening, everyone. The Dog Management Act allows us to uh, make a decision around declaring a dog as dangerous. So it's related directly to uh, the behaviour of the animal and a report um, back into Council's animal management section to investigate and then declare that dog. So it's, it's directly related to the dog's uh, actions and a witness statements around those actions. So there's quite a process to declare a dog and it is quite factual from the point of view of um, direct statements from witnesses. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Bull. If I can, uh, a question to the director, please. Uh, so there are a list though of uh, a category of dangerous dogs by breed or not? Uh, not under the Dog Management Act. Right. So the, the legislation we're operating under um, doesn't specify a dog as a dog breed as such. Right. I was, I was going to foreshadow an, an amendment, but I won't now that that's not the case. So thank you. Alderman Sims. Um, I think this is a great amendment. Thank you, Alderman Hickey. Um, I think it's really important that we take dangerous dogs seriously. Never in my life have I encountered so many than around the Glenorchy municipality. Um, I've encountered them at my doorstep at home. I've encountered them walking past them, neighbours on the street, big dogs that have got out, which 
very luckily, majority have been friendly. Um, not to say they haven't been scary at the time. Uh, I've been very lucky not to um, have any serious encounters, but I have seen smaller children um, have encounters that have been very concerning and risky. So I think we need to um, promote responsible dog ownership. I've actually done a lot of investigating and research around this kind of thing through running an animal campaign many years ago. And even back then, the evidence-based research showed it wasn't actually the breed. The breed were preferred by people who decided to raise their dogs in that manner. Um, and unfortunately, they were um, successful for the items and the activities those people wanted to use them for. So it's really sad that the dogs such as pit bulls and things like that get a really bad reputation, but they're actually proven to be um, family dogs if raised well and properly as they should be. So I think this will promote that um, and also help just on the street us recognise what they are um, as well as eliminate some of those risks. So thank you. Mayor, can I just ask? Yeah, sorry, the director was oh, just going to respond there. Thank you, Mayor. Through you, Mayor. Um, just to give Alderman a little context around why the recommendation was originally two hundred dollars and before the foreshadowed um, uh, motion. Clearly, we've only got a handful of dogs in the municipality that have been declared. Um, as Alderman Hickey outlined, there is currently no dangerous dog fee. Uh, in the municipality at the moment, so we're rectifying that by introducing a fee. Those dogs that are owned are currently, uh, the majority of them are on a concession de sexed um, amount of $35. The officers absolutely agree that responsible dog ownership is what we, we must be encouraging. Just to be mindful of that increase from $35 to $200 may see some of those, and if we're, we're talking $500, may uh, likely see those owners not being able to pay that fee. Therefore, they would then relinquish the dog to council. Council would then um, uh, take the dog, and the outcome of that would be either the dog is rehomed elsewhere or it is then euthanised. So, not saying one or the other, but just being very clear, um, the decision we're making tonight is highly likely, and you might have outlined your thoughts around that already, highly likely um, those dogs may not find a home and therefore will uh, reach a conclusion to their lives. Does that come at a further cost to council no. if that happens, like in terms of managing that? If they are relinquished to council, that, that is obviously a burden to council to manage. Uh, thank you, Matt. We, uh, the answer is yes and no. We already have an arrangement in place with the Tasmanian Dogs Home to rehouse those dogs. So they, once they take them, they would go through that process. There is obviously um, officer time involved in doing doing that work. Sure. Uh, Alderman Richardson, then Alderman Hickey, did you have another question as well? Uh, Alderman Richardson. I guess if it's okay, because it might inform your debate. I'm just wondering if we, if with the um, agreement agreement of the seconder that maybe because this has become recently very significant in our community that we might have a three that says this gets reviewed annually. Yes, well, I was going to suggest can we just have t as two to review it again next year rather than scaring people with this? Oh, I do think we need to send a message. But they are people's pets, regardless of... But they're not... If we had an officer eaten or a child scarred, how do we feel about that? <clears throat> It's risk management. Alderman Richardson? Yes, just going back to um, your explanation of that and just more detail, just clarification around if, if enforcing this involves, if they can't pay the fee, we take the dog. Correct. Three men, correct. <laughs> how it's managed. Or well, they manage the dog. We take it to the dog club. Hmm. Um, in regards to that, if we're concerned about um, the fee um, being incurred in one lump sum this year, maybe we could compromise on the $500 and $1,000 the following year. Think about that. Um, <laughs> you thought about it? <laughs> Consider it. Um, but also I think 
we have an obligation and it, it is easy to have emotional response to this, but I think we have a responsibility as animal, animal management um, department to, to actually um, actively do something about it as much as we can and to do that as fairly as we can to the animal and to the owner. And I think having a fee is important. I think there needs to be some safeguards and some kind of safety net. But I also think the hardship policy is something that could come into play here um, as well. And also perhaps making some really key relationships with some people around Tasmania that specialise in retraining and rehoming animals that have been through such horrific circumstances and have got to this point. So there are people that do that and I have a lot of connections and I'm happy to chat with staff afterwards if they'd like those connections. Questions, my lady? Yeah, um, just to preempt, I, I do like dogs. My daughter's got a dog and I walk it regularly and, and it jumps on me and I love the thing. But my question is, we're only talking about dangerous dogs. How many are we talking about? Ten. We're not, ten. ten. So exactly. So we're not, ten that we know of. Ten that have been declared. So declared, yes. So ten that have been declared. They have to have been declared by council. So we're not talking about... I just got to find the right way to say this without upsetting people about the mass annihilation of the, of the dog population of Glenorchy. We're, we're just talking about protecting the community from those dogs that may cause or have been judged to, to potentially cause serious harm to the community. So, um, well, it's trying to de incentivize the ownership of them by charging a higher fee. Now, whether absolutely. that will actually have that impact or not is unknown. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Do you have a question on the Yes, I do. I will. I will uh, phrase, it as, phrase it as a question. Um, I suppose in a way we also need to look at us, you know, talking about council as a business, would it be that we need to um, get some of those costs back around the administration of this? Through you, man. Yes. That's the intention, <laughs> That's the intention of the part of the intention of this is recognising the cost of administration involved with declaring dogs. Yeah. If I may need to add to my yes, um, if, if a dog is declared, obviously the owner, if they wish to continue ownership of the dog, they need to comply with the Act and that's about building a, a sufficient space that complies with the Act to contain the dog. So there is a there is an expense for the owner if they have a dog declared, uh, they then need to build a, a, um, a facility, and I won't quote the, the measurements to you, but build a facility that the dog is then contained in, in a humane way. If they uh, so there's a, there's an inherent cost in in doing that, and uh, our animal management staff inspect that to make sure that's acceptable, and not two pieces of chicken wire. So yeah, uh, there, there is cost in doing that. Now another question. Another question. Could then order member board just off question. the back of that. Um, so that would also eliminate the risk of people's dogs getting out accidentally, especially dangerous dogs, which shouldn't be getting out accidentally anyway. Correct. Thank you. Order member board. Yes, uh, through to the director. Thank you. The, obviously, the council categorise if a dog is dangerous. Is that correct? What if the owner disputes that? Can that go into a lengthy dispute? And my second question after that is that if the owner then is responsible and has the dog trained, can they then seek to have it assessed as being non-dangerous and therefore Go back to a normal fee. Through you, Ben. Excellent question. I'll take the first one first. Yes, um, there is a process. So, if uh, our staff declare a dog dangerous, the owners then have 28 days um, to respond or lodge a complaint um, or lodge a challenge to that, depending on the circumstances. Um, and we have one um, available at the moment where um, the dog has been declared. Um, our officers have received a challenge to that, so we've given them another 28 days to work through that challenge. So depending on what, what the circumstance is. The second question, I'll take on notice, I'm not sure, I, I'm not aware, not aware of a dog being, as Alderman Sims has outlined, a dog's um, been declared, its uh, behaviour being modified and then effectively joining civilisation again as a, as a full and proper citizen. But I'm, yeah. I might take that on, on notice <laughs> if that's okay. It's definitely happened. I can show you some proof. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Ryan. Thanks. Um, I also, uh, like you, Mayor, was thinking along the lines of introducing the fee at 500 mm. with a review thereafter because it's a new fee. 
It's not going up. This is a new fee. So we don't know what the effect of it is going to be yet. So I think 200 is maybe not going to do anything at all, but 500, I think it might be fair to see what's going to happen and then have a review in either six months' time or a year's time. What do you think? Well, Mayor, if I could just inform that debate, um, I think you'll understand the size of the problem if I ask the question <laughs> of the director. Uh, is it true that we had three dangerous dogs collected from one family recently? Three men. Um, the answer is we've had of that particular property, two were declared dangerous and the third one has been seized. Seized. Not so, declared dangerous. Yes. yes. So with the 10 dangerous dogs on our book, uh, Director, it is, can I ask that it's not a very big problem uh, for the community? Three men. I have so to ask these the inane questions. As far as quantity of a problem, it depends on how we might answer that. I would suggest we, we perhaps have uh, close to 9,000 dogs in our community and 10 of those being uh, dangerous declared dangerous, um, you could suggest it's a minimal problem. However, if uh, <coughs> one of those dangerous dogs uh, acted against you and were declared dangerous because of something they did to you, I, I'm sure that person would think it, it is a, an issue. It certainly is an issue within our community. It's how we deal with it. And I, I go back to where the officers were um, recommending to say, look, we're starting from no fee. We introduce, we suggest we introduce a fee and absolutely we should be monitoring this and increase that fee if, if that's acceptable. Um, the officer's advice was we would think with those uh, those animals already in the system that the majority of those will be um, handed over. They, yeah. they perhaps won't be supported beyond me. So can I just ask then um, in relation to uh, this idea of approving a fee for next year's fees and charges. We set our fees and charges annually. So this will come to us for approval or not next year, but would it be like overturning a decision of council? Like does this complicate the setting of fees for next year if we're effectively setting a fee a year in advance procedurally? Through you mean not necessarily. It's um, we can set it at a thousand dollars and we review it when it comes next year. So so we can yeah so so Either way, come next year when we would go to set our fees and charges at our May meeting, it'll be but the will of the council has been spoken now. Yeah, and if that, if this is approved, that's what it'll be going in at. Yes, Mayor. Um, to phrase this as a question to you, do you not see this as a very strong message from the council that we do not accept people not um, keeping their dogs under control? and protecting children, other people's pets, vulnerable older people, and our own staff. So that was the message I was trying to convey. Alderman Ball? Uh, yes, the, the question would be is I'd like to have an answer to that second question of mine, but mm. I do agree with the recommendation. Uh, but I'd like to know, because that's an, I, I believe, mm -hmm. isn't that, an incentive if they can get that dog declassified as dangerous. Mm. Mm. So, but otherwise, so, so. I agree with the, uh, um, as the acting general manager said, we can set it at the 500 and then the 1000 next year and they can review it. Some sort of leave it as is. Any further discussion? Alderman Dunsby. A question probably for Director Richardson. So, under the hardship policy, um, let's say a household had two, as we've heard, there's some that may have two or three dogs. Are they eligible to apply under the hardship policy, um, even though it is related to this and not fees? Um, yeah, yes, yes. yes. We review any any um, issue that any of our ratepayers um, were having, with, it, with whatever it was in relation to. Um, they may not be a ratepayer, they may be somebody leasing a property. <coughs> who doesn't own the property that has a dangerous dog, but it's a fair charge, a fine similar to a motor vehicle, parking fine, same sort of thing if people need support 
where we offer support through the policy. So they may have done all the right things and been containing dogs and gone to a considerable expense and now facing this again. So no, thank you, I appreciate mm -hmm. that will be available. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I just want to speak to it briefly and just say that I think having this two-step process is a good thing and it does send that message that we very strongly uh, encourage people to do the right thing when they do have a dangerous dog and, and so they know if they have a dog in that situation what the future implications may be and I'm very comfortable with the two-step process that we've got outlined. Okay. Thank you, Roman. Can I just ask you a question, Roman, talking about setting that um, that message, I guess, and when we talk about um, doing the right thing, you know, we want, we're signalling to people we want them to do the right thing. I'm interested to know what is that right thing? Because ultimately, if we're saying pay a thousand dollars or have your dog euthanized, is that what we're saying is what we ultimately would like them to do? Because they could be keeping their dog contained and still having to be paid, be having to pay a thousand dollars a year. But what is it that we're actually ultimately wanting them to do? Well, my opinion, Mayor, is that these dogs have been neglected to be dangerous dogs and the owners have been warned and there's a considerable process for a dog to be declared dangerous. What I would like to ask the uh, Director of the question is, do we have a policy in Glenorchy that says over two dogs they should be kenneled or have a kennel licence? Through you, Mayor, um, you're allowed to keep two dogs on your property. If you go beyond two, you need to then apply for a licence to do so. So, uh, given that the particular case we're referring to, it's not the first time of dangerous dogs and three dogs were, have been taken in uh, without a kennel being constructed on that property or a kennel licence, is that true? Um, through you, Mayor, um, officers have become aware of the property recently and have been moving to understand the exact circumstances of that property. Um, the current occupant of that property has been less than easy to uh, acquire a clear understanding of what's going on in the problem. Yes. Did you say you took one dog? Three. I guess um, if I can speak to the, the item, I guess, um, you know, setting policy is an uh, important role that we have as a council. Um, I'm very mindful of trying to set policy based on um, a whole rather than with a view of one particular instance. And I think it can be very, um, uh, you know, we are emotive people and it can be very... Um, human nature for us to try and make rules because of a you know one particular experience that we've had i guess i'm thinking of broader um, situations that may occur where where um you know dogs brains can just snap and they can do different things they might bite people out of reaction to fear and i know it's perhaps not just one you know one instance that we'll see a dog declared as dangerous but it could happen to any of our dogs get, you know could could react to a certain situation and, and bite someone and then you know this is so, so I guess I'm, I'm just mindful of are there other, um, I hear loud and clear the message that we're wanting to send and I understand um, the need to protect uh, people from dangerous dogs. Absolutely, I do. Um, and, I, and I want us to be a council that does that. But I guess I'm trying to um, get, a, get that bigger picture of, well, actually, what impacts this going to have. Um, and I don't know that, you know, there's, there's quite a few questions that I would have to be able to, uh, that I would want answered to be able to um, make this sort of policy decision around it, I think that it perhaps warrants a bit of further exploration before we go setting a fee for next year. So I think it's something that um, I'm supportive of the $500 fee for this year up front and noting that it is a significant increase, so it is sending a strong message and signal, um, given that at the moment it's not nowhere near that. Um, so and, and it is something new that we're introducing. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive of that, but I prefer to do a bit more um, analysis, I think, given there is significant interest around the table before setting a decision about next year's fees. So that's my view. It's only a recommendation, isn't it? Because that can be reviewed, that thousand. Next year, but yes, but as um, Director uh. Richardson has said, that is, would be setting the, the fee in advance for next year that will be going for consideration. I'll just ask a follow-up question to clarify. What you're saying there, or at least what I think you're saying is to the director, the point where a dog is, is deemed dangerous, I mean, if I walk in someone's property and the dog bites me because it's protecting its area, I, I get that. 
Okay, if it savages me, it's different. If it's nipped at me, mm. I don't see that as a dangerous dog. But what what do we declare? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of work goes into it before we determine a dog is dangerous. Mm. And we declare it's dangerous. It's not like a moment in time. And it depends on the severity, I guess. Well, that's it? what I'm getting at. Yeah. It's not like a moment in time. As I said, if it savages me, it's different to if it nips me because I've walked in the front yard and the dog just saw an intruder. Um, I, I get that. Three men. <laughs> uh, you're correct. There, there is a, as I outlined earlier, there is a, a detailed process to go through before a dog is collected. It, it involves um, clear um, statements from witnesses that have seen a, a, an attack or an incident, um, and the officers investigate that fully because um, it, it's clear a serious legal matter for the owners themselves. So we can't um, willy nilly declare a dog dangerous just on hearsay. So there is a quite lengthy formal process so you, you correct deputy mayor it's, it's got a nip of um your finger as you're getting through the front gate yeah exactly i mean i, I went to knock on a guy's door once and shook his hand he shook my hand the labrador bit me and he kicked the labrador and he said on air even but nevertheless the thing is the dog wasn't has never bitten anyone in its life but it's just a reaction to me putting my hand towards him so maybe it's just me <laughs> no no stop it <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you're a dangerous person. <laughs> oh, no. oh, no, Richard, I'll just ask you to elaborate on that. So just to be clear, we have clear guidelines. Mm -hmm. We have clear guidelines around categorising a dog as dangerous and a clear understanding of what a responsible owner needs to, to the steps they need to take to address that. Is that that's what you're saying? Through you, Matt. Uh, yes, to the first part of the question. When you say address that on Richardson, you mean if a dog has been declared, what an owner has to do after that? And they have a complete understanding of what they have to do to address that, and if they don't, and they are aware of the consequences. We have Correct. clear guidelines setting that out. Correct. Fine, thank you. Your question, yeah, here's, Alderman, here's a big question for you. Is it not possible from this moment forward to start warning people that they're not responsible dog owners, this is the this is the ramification because it doesn't take place until the dog is categorised as dangerous and we start breaking people in that this council is very serious about responsible dog ownership. We actually encourage it and talk about dog parks. We could do everything positive about the good things that we can do and the opportunities to love and care and keep your dog safe. But I think it never hurts to reiterate that more than two dogs is against policy. If you do not control your dog, if you do not have it on lead when it should be on lead, if you do not pick up your poo, it's that's not an offensive word. <laughs> um, you know, you have breaking <laughs> rules. So we can reiterate that through all of our social media and any other, even on the rates notice, would that be okay, uh, Director? Uh, through you, Mayor, we have to do it a separate flyer, um, but that's that's easy enough to do to an insert. No, it's probably more effective, actually. Exactly. We have that. been having discussion about including some information with the rates notices about our new dog management, or our mm -hmm. reviewed dog management policy and dog um, areas where dogs are and aren't permitted around our municipality. Because I think we can. Um, there's more to do in that, and then certainly the the um, targeted reference group we had for the strategy. <coughs> on supportive right of having this um, particular fee, um, I, I don't recall having discussion around the amount. I'd be interested in the, the members of that targeted reference group, you know, from the dog's home and from um, RSPCA Tasmania and and, uh, and the Hobart Dog Walking Association. I'd be really interested in their view on this um, debate tonight, actually. And if I may, through you, Mayor, um, absolutely, that the targeted reference group that um, worked on the dog management policy, they they identified this as something we should be doing. They, as the Mayor just said, they, they certainly didn't suggest a, a figure, but they were very keen, um, now the dog management policy has been adopted, that we um, continue to work with that group in some shape or form to talk about responsible dog. <laughs> Uh, management, <laughs> yeah. dog ownership, and, yes. and what, that, what that looks like um, for the, the overall community. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to match these two. Is, cool. is there a fine or is there a penalty for a dog owner who walks their dogs and will not put them on the lead? That's where most of the problem I've found with our dogs is that and people 
you know, they'll have four staffies or something walking down the street. If, if they're in an area where it's an off-lead area. Um, just a walk, look, say, up the main road. Well, that would be an on-lead area. Yeah, it's so an on-lead area. I know, but a there lot would of, be a fine. Uh, yep. Against the owner? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. What is that fine? Uh, you know? Something something penalty unit. Yeah. Something <laughs> penalty unit. Yeah. Sorry, what's a penalty unit? Yeah. No. Take a photo of them, Pete. Get them on the security camera. Yeah. All right. I'm just mindful of um of uh, do you have a question, Alderman Sim? Quick question. Um the fee here, I did have a look um just at the information Alderman Hickey had provided, you have actually done a bit of research around what other councils are doing, and I could see that you've averaged out and moderated against that, which is really great to see. And um, I think I'm in a bit of a um, advanced position having already run animal campaigns and things and understanding around some of those other things. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And what's your question? Sorry? She had a question mark up. She'd already answered it. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the rules of debate. Do you have a question, Alderman? I do. Um, <coughs> is it not shocking that so many organisations were just quoted in that consideration of um, the dog management policy that we have? So this is actually very expensive to a lot of charities. We have to disincentivise from the beginning. No, that's not shocking, and I don't believe that was actually a question. But I anyway, did. No, I started going, Alderman Carlton. I do have a question. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, so just listening um, to some of the questions um, that have been raised around the table, um, you know, I certainly um, support the two recommendations that we've got. But I think it will send a message out to the community about our stance at council. Um, doing what Alderman Hickey is saying is that this fee is applied when a dog is declared dangerous. So there is some time that we can spend in the lead up to uh, this fee necessarily being enforced. Um, that uh, the idea of, of that sort of positive um, using that sort of education and that sort of communication. I've also heard around the table around um, the second recommendation. So just around um, if we approve the inclusion of a fee for not next financial year but the following financial year, does that actually commit us to actually having that specific um, fee? So my question is around, um, you know, we, we want to do this tonight, so we're sending out a message, we're sending out an advance warning that this is what it's going to cost you, so please take every step that we don't need to. Um, enforce this particular um, penalty um, or fee. So even though we're, we've got the word approve in this recommendation, um, does that, we will still get an opportunity next year to actually review this fee, won't we? So we're not actually um, locking it in the stone that this is actually going to be the fee that we're going to charge for the following financial year. So three minutes, the person in charge is scheduled, will come to you for approval as it does now, the meeting prior to the budget. Within that, it will have the $1,000 recommendation from this meeting. At that point in time, you can review those fees and charges yeah. and change that fee if that's not the fee. So even though it says approved, it's really recommend that. Yes. And yes. There is the, so um, what, on that basis, I'm more comfortable with that. Um, uh, bear in mind that something that's been quite important to me and also to other aldermen is that we're considering our costs so that anything that we charge does actually cover the costs involved in, in that action so it might be that we're saying we're recommending a thousand dollars for inclusion or we're approving that thousand dollars but it might actually end up being more than that yeah so um, yes. but certainly um the importance of the hard fish, hardship policy in that sort of first year, I think, is also important um, as we introduce this um, to give people time to adjust to that. And so sorry, it's through you, Mayor, I'll just correct to the hardship policy, in fact, only relates to rates. Okay. So we'll need to amend the hardship policy to consider um, fees such as this or have an alternate directive that enables consideration of separate fines as we do now people come in and speak to us we make um arrangements people stick to the arrangements and then that's how it's paid yeah. so we'll, we'll either adjust the hardship policy or create a separate yeah no my yeah my understanding was that that mechanism already applies to compliance charges that, yes. that if for example if someone has an issue paying their parking fine 
we can negotiate that. That doesn't require a hardship policy to do that. It's a separate process. Is that a question, right? Yeah, that's what I was just saying. <laughs> my understanding is, is that right? That is right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. So my apologies to all the adjustments that we're just correcting that. Yeah, that might have been context. Context. And I just wanted clarification. Yeah, and, and I think that because um, I was all speaking and asking questions too. Um, hey, you haven't spoken to the motion. Yet, no, no. So, so it's a sort of part question, part speaking. So I, I think that um, given that this, uh, we want to send a strong signal to the community. I think we're doing that through these recommendations, but uh, we do also need to consider that this is going to be a significant cost, and actually having the opportunity to offer the hardship policy in this instance, I think, is um, is important. Um, and then reviewing what that looks like um, in 12 months' time when we come to these charges. So we've got it here as charges, rates and charges. The assistant, she's talking Fees and charges. Fees, fees and, and charges. charges. So we approved our fees and charges at our last... No, in the hardship policy. You're talking about. Hardship policy. Oh, in the hardship What we've got on our website, we're saying rates and charges. I always assumed it was for anything people pay at council, they could access the hardship okay, policy. Uh, you're, you might be looking at the COVID-19 specific one, Alderman Sin. And that's worded differently, is yes. it, to the... Yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So if you look on our website under Council and Policies and then Governance and Administration, the, there's one... Um, sorry, I take that back. It's under Rates, Finance and Council Services. There's a financial hardship policy from June 2019 um, and it was from that that the COVID um, guidelines for financial hardship were based. Um, effectively, they were a, a directive that permitted departure from the policy, but the standard policy applies only to, quite explicitly, only to rates. So, sorry, we can't actually find the hardship policy online. I will um, forward a link in the... Um, COVID-19, they're all COVID-19. Oh, here we go. That's something we can um, we can take offline so it's separate to this debate. So getting back to this so it's great um, particular uh, debate then to uh, bring it to a close, if I may, and I do have another question. Our officers are regretful that this got missed in the original <laughs> fees and charges motion. So I'm being a bit now. Uh, so if there's no further discussion of the debate, I will go back to the mover, Alderman Hickey, to close debate. Uh, yes, and I thank all of the old ones for considering this and um, for having a spirited conversation about it and um, considering the ramifications to members of our public. I um, also thank the Mayor for allowing the um, discussion and a few broken rules because I do think it's a very important matter and we have to encourage responsible dog ownership. So thank you. Thank you. And I will put the recommendation to the vote. Please raise your hand to indicate if you are for. That is carried unanimously. Ooh. All right. That brings out. Uh, I just want to go back to uh, item six and the recommendation that we passed. The second point says. Um, Associate Council Work Capital Works Program for the 22-23 financial year from the 1st of July 2021. Should that read 2022 and do we need to revisit that, please? Authorise the 31.511 million capital expenditure associated with Council's Capital Works Program for the 2022-23 financial year from 1st of July 2021. I would take it as implicit, given it talks about the Capital Works Program for the 2022-23. I'll take advice from Director Richardson on that. Yeah. My question so is, is, is it a typo, typo or, or do we even need the words from 1st of July 2021 and is there any implications? I think it's not it no potentially no correct, so, but I didn't want it to be left. Yes, sure. You know, like Director Riley. Through you, Mayor, I can, I can assure you that is a typo. Yeah. We'd like to get an early start, but I think that's <laughs> <laughs> So it is from You're the not a backwards council so after all. So we have now moved the motion with a typo. Can we go back and correct that? Uh, it doesn't materially affect the outcome of the decision, would be my, um, would be my judgment call on that one. Will annoy Jen or not? Yeah. Mm. Mm. We've made something that's, that's not correct, and I should have spotted it earlier. Yeah. Uh, through you, Mayor, we could just we could do a correction for 
or the minutes, I assume that could be potentially the approval of everybody around the table. That's why. So we need. Uh, so Alderman Dunsby, you're raising a motion that item, um, the recommendation two in item six is amended for the minutes to read 2022. Thank you. 2022. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put that as a procedural motion. Please I'll raise your hand if you are for. That's carried unanimously. The fee for a dangerous director. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that it's brings our uh, special council meeting for 20th of June 2022 to a close. Thank you, um, Ms. Hanks, for joining us here tonight. Thank you to members of the public who have joined us online. Thank you all for your participation. Stay safe, stay warm, be kind to each other, and we'll see you next Monday night at 6 pm for our ordinary council meeting. It's the ordinary. <laughs>